the characteristic of the Son of God was absolute trust. Even when he said, you're going to leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Absolute trust in the Father. Absolute confidence. Even on the cross, they accused him of that. They said he trusted in God. Let God now deliver him. Even there, when all heaven seemed to have forsaken him, he trusted in God. In the last extremity, that's why death could not hold him. It was impossible. Now the Bible says, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. You will trust in a person in proportion as you have confidence in them. Sometimes little children have a lot of confidence. When I saw my kindergarten teacher in Switzerland, I was now bigger than she. She said, you've been a great blessing to me when you were a baby. I said, is that so? Yes, she said. And then she told me how. She said, she took me one day and lifted me up like this. And she said, now what if I drop you? She said, you smiled at me. And you said, oh, you're not going to drop me. And she said, how do you know that? Well, she said, I said to her, why, because you love me too much for that. Just a little child and just a little woman and a Swiss woman at that. But I had that much trust, that much confidence. I wasn't a bit afraid. And of course she didn't drop me. What I said was the truth. Now, beloved, that's our victory to put our trust in him. It's a very wonderful Bible study to go through the Psalms or through the whole Bible and to mark all the promises to those who trust in the Lord. They that trust in the Lord can never be removed. They shall be like Mount Zion that cannot be removed. And then again, oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. And then again, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. They're fallen. They've fallen off their horses. But we stand upright. We have trusted in the Lord. Blessed are all they that put their trust in thee. What a wonderful lesson. What marvelous promises. Here's one for you personally, individually now. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord Jehovah forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. It seems to be one of the great lessons that God has for his people. Listen, God cannot do anything for me if I don't put my trust in him. Now that's strange, but that's the law of the kingdom. If I don't trust in the Lord, Madam Guyan says, we perish for want of trusting him. None that trust in him shall be desolate. In one place it says, and none that trust in me shall be ashamed. Isn't that wonderful? Do you believe that? Amen. Well, now we ought to examine a little bit and see what it means to trust in the Lord. It's a matter of the heart, not of the head. I've dealt with people who were sick. And they say, well, I dealt with a woman who had swallowed a bone. And she couldn't sing anymore very well. The bone was stuck in her throat. And I said, why don't you go to a doctor and have him pull it out with a pair of pliers? Oh, she says, I want to trust in the Lord. Well, then I began to wriggle around on that bone a little bit. And I found out the reason she didn't want to go to the doctor was because she was scared. She wasn't trusting in the Lord at all. 
That was far from her mind, but she was scared to go to the doctor. And so she said, oh, how many times people say meekly, I'll trust in the Lord. Maybe they're too cheap to pay the medicine or pay for the doctor. They're not trusting in the, when you trust in the Lord, you have results. Now put that in your notebook. None that trust in him shall be ashamed. None. Now what is the matter with my trust? It may be mental. Some people try to force God to help them by saying, well, they're trusting in the Lord. Listen, it's a very serious matter. It's an awfully serious matter. The Bible says that trusting in the Lord is a matter of the heart. And so much so, it also tells us that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself mighty toward them whose hearts are perfect toward him. That's trust in the Lord. When it's a matter of the heart, then you don't advertise it, you don't brag about it, how much you trust the Lord. It's something in your heart that will keep him in perfect peace because he trusts us in the Lord. Oh, that's it. Perfect peace is the characteristic of perfect trust. But the Bible tells us that if my heart is not perfect, it's a double-minded heart. I don't need to expect anything from the Lord. It says you don't get anything from the Lord, even though God is, I was going to say anxious. God is never anxious. But God is eager. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself mighty. He talks about the exceeding greatness of his power. And now he's talking about the power of redemption. And when I look at myself, I can say, Oh God, I thank thee because I am fearfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and that my soul knows right well. And I didn't help God when he made the world or the universe. He did it himself. He did it by his great wisdom, and I cannot help him to perfect me spiritually and present me spotless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. It's got to be altogether God's job, and I cannot help him in healing my body when I'm in need of healing. God's got to do it. But God did it when he raised Jesus, my Lord, from the dead and commissioned him, gave him the job, gave him the command to perfect redemption in me and in all that put their trust in him. That's why trust is so exceedingly important and that's the reason we can't fool with this subject. We may think we trust the Lord because we pick the promise out of the promise box. Lots of people do that. I saw a consumptive woman do that one time. Somebody gave her a message, told her that she was going to be healed, and oh, she had such an unction and such a wonderful blessing, and then she died. It wasn't real at all. You can't fool with these things. It's a gift of God when your heart is perfect toward him. It's because you know his name. And that's where we fail. We fall down on the job of seeking to know him. Paul said, I count everything but refuse, that I may win Christ, that I may be found in him. He said, I don't consider myself perfect. It's a big job. And you know God perfected that job in Paul. And have you ever found out how God did it? Why well, said we had the sentence of death in ourselves? Terrible. Terrible. You prayed and everybody prayed and you sent messages to all the Pentecostal churches. Please stand in prayer and stand in faith. Or maybe you send out a mimeograph letter to the ends of the earth. We're going to take a trip now or we're going to go on the mission field and please pray and take faith that the money be supplied for our fare and so on. And nothing comes in. Mailman comes and he brings you a lot of bills and not a dollar bill. <laughs> Terrible. 
we have the sentence of death in ourselves. We have nothing to do. No lookout, no hope, no expectation anywhere. God said, it serves you right. You don't know. You don't know your own heart. You don't know there's a little bit of a root of trusting in yourself, maybe in your own faith. You've, you've had a blessing. You've had wonderful healings. You've had wonderful answers to prayer. And you don't know how the old man has taken credit to himself. You don't realize, oh, beloved, Jesus is going to have a clean people, and they're going to be like unto himself. And they're going to give all the glory to him, praise God. And why not rather learn our lesson than complain? Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Nothing can come my way but by the appointment of my Father, who has loved me before the foundation of the world. And he says, And you think that I've forgotten you? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who has created these things? that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by name, by the greatness of his might. He is strong in power. Not a single one faileth. And it tell us there are billions and billions, not of stars, but of universes. Praise the Lord, and he calleth them all by name. And it's a new thing. I forgot you, you little trip. You think that I don't hear your prayer? You think that I don't know all about you? And you squirm and fuss, and I've got to let you squirm and fuss until you come to your senses, until you lift up your eyes on high, like Abraham did. He said, Abraham, come out of that tent. Don't listen to Sarah anymore. Come out. Come into my tent. Lift up your eyes. Look. That's how your seed is going to be. Praise God said it. God said it. That settles it. But, beloved, it doesn't settle it. That's the trouble with us. It doesn't settle it until we have dealt with God about it seriously. We need to be very serious prayer warriors. You know that? Madam Guy says, don't let anybody think that you'll get to heaven without prayer. Now, that would be put down as a false doctrine today. But God has arranged it that way. He said, in nothing be anxious, but in everything. Everything becomes a subject for prayer. Everything becomes a subject, hallelujah, becomes a contact. You've got contact. We like them. And if we haven't got them, we put them there. We need a contact for our lights and for our ham and organ and for our recording instruments. And we need contact for our wash machines. And whenever there's a contact, why, well, you've got contact. But you've got to find that contact. And every circumstance in my life is a contact for God to manifest the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. Why do I murmur? Why do I dispute? I find fault with God. I don't believe that all things work together for good to them that love God. I talked to a preacher some time ago who was sick. Sick. And I said, Romans 8, 28. All things work together. He didn't believe. I said, what? You don't believe? Was the preacher that had been greatly blessed of God. Oh, so wonderfully blessed in Pentecost. But you know, when you don't walk in the light, that light will become darkness. And today, this fellow was sick, and instead of seeking to the Lord, he sought not to the doctors only, but every doctor book and every healing book. He had all kinds of doctrines about vitamins. Now, if your little toe aches, why, you need vitamin X. Now go to the infirmary or get some vitamin X. And take some of that dehydrated fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> Beloved, the holes we fall in. And they that put their trust in him, he waits to manifest the exceeding greatness of his power. What power is that? Why, to us who do believe, it's the power of his redemption. And if I allowed God to make a man out of me, and he didn't make a monkey out of me, thank God. He did it by his own plan, and his plan that I should be like Jesus. I ought to let him do it. I ought to put my trust in him. I ought to say, here goes Lord. And I cannot trust the Lord except 
in the hour of trial. When the trial's over and the victory is won, you don't have to exercise trust anymore. Then you praise him. Then you thank him. But it's in the hour of trial. When the boat goes up, and they didn't have any gyroscopes in those boats on Lake Genesaret. Now that thing was going up and going up. Going up, and Peter was hanging on to the mast, and he had a bad conscience. He had a fight with his wife that morning over the scrambled eggs. He wanted her to unscramble them. You know how these husbands are. <laughs> and now this terrible storm. And he finally said, oh, if only the master was here, Mr. John. Why, he's here. I saw him there, sleeping in the back of the boat. Oh, he must have washed over the board long before he left away. It's all right when you're in a Pentecostal meeting, shouting hallelujah with everybody. Then you know, the Lord is here. Jesus is here. Let us open our hearts to him. But goodness, when you... They have these six containers in the plane. They didn't have any there. They had to hang over the rail. <laughs> well, now let somebody come see the Lord here. Open your heart. <laughs> well, you don't feel like it, do you? <laughs> oh, they that put their trust in him. Beloved, they shall never be ashamed. The Bible tells. I'm not telling you this. I'm not bragging about my trust. The apostle Paul has the sentence of, and he was an apostle, but he has the sentence of death in him, and God allowed it. He said, we had a lesson to learn. I have not yet attained. Oh, here I am. I am willing for lesson, any lesson that God has for me. Praise God. The sentence of death taught me the greatest lesson of all, that we should not trust in ourselves. Well, if I can't trust in myself anymore, who can I trust in? But God who raises the dead. Tell me, who do you trust in? Who is it that your heart is fixed? My heart is fixed. It's an experience. When God puts trust into your heart, it's an experience that makes Jesus Christ supreme in your thoughts. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. That's where the trouble comes in. We have thoughts, and how many times do we open our hearts to the thoughts of men? You never get into any kind of a trouble, but all the aunts and uncles and cousins and all your relatives come around. Yeah, I know what that is. I, my great-grandmother died from that. I, I know. I have a doctor book at home that tells you just... What's the matter with you? You can't go a half a block from this church after having had a wonderful divine healing service and somebody will put thoughts of the devil into your head. You you watch and see if that isn't so. I'm surprised. As soon as somebody gets sick, I visit them sometimes, and then so-and-so was here and told me it was bad. Listen, if you haven't got anything to bring but unbelief, stay home. The word of faith which we preach. It isn't in heaven. You don't have to get it down. It's not in the death. It's in your heart. Christ is in your heart. Thank God. He can never be removed. And he is there for a job. He is there to be the Lord, the Redeemer, to bring you out of every situation and to make you like unto himself. And here we are wavering, wavering, Spending all our lives complaining and murmuring. Watch it sometimes. Get a, a recording instrument that records everything you say and every sigh you hear. And you'll be surprised at the end of the day how many times you've murmured and complained and kicked about something. That's what defeated Israel. Beloved, God's eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth today, still today, and is looking for those whose hearts are perfect toward him. God knows what I think in my heart. 
What I say with my lips is not near as important, but what I think, what I feel in my heart, and when my heart is perfect, I will not be anxious. That will be gone. It will be impossible. I will think the thoughts of God, and the Bible gives me his thoughts. I have thoughts of peace toward you. Go through the whole Bible and see the exceeding great and precious promises. And every one of them is for you and for me. Praise God. And who will guarantee their fulfillment? Why, God has guaranteed them when he raised Jesus, my Lord, from the dead. When Jesus came in flesh, he said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. The Spirit of God is upon me. He has anointed me for this purpose. And I always wondered, why was it that Jesus Christ demanded absolute faith from the Israelites? He marveled at their unbelief. He said, where's your faith? He says, why are you so fearful? What right did he have? Why, he had a right to say in the face of death, don't fear. I'm resurrection and life. What are you afraid of? Is that death? Well, that's what I came for, to conquer death, to abolish death, to bring life and immortality to life through the gospel. And if he demanded that when he was in the flesh, how much more today when he is glorified? How much more does he demand faith of me for the fullness of the Holy Ghost when today that's his whole job to represent me in the presence of God and to make sure that every prayer of mine in his name finds a fulfillment. I ought to really be serious about this lesson. I ought to get to the Bible. I ought to study the Word of God and see what it means to trust in the Lord. And I ought not to be satisfied with the mere profession of my lips. You'll fail every time. But when you pray through, and that's what the Bible teaches us in Philippians 4, 6, that's the best recipe for us all. In nothing be anxious. What is your anxiety over? People will come. And they'll ask you to pray for them. And then they'll spill it all out. They'll tell you how sick they are until you have a, an education in anatomy that you can't get in any biological institution in the world. You can see the inside of their gallbladder and their stomach. And one man explained to me what his stomach looked like on the inside and all that. And they're just looking for sympathy. That's all. When you put your trust in him, that's none of your business. Absolutely none of your business. You expect everything from him because he has done everything. He is resurrection and life, and he says, I know you were dead. Don't you fear. Don't you worry. But we don't learn that lesson overnight, you know. It's step by step. It was that way with the Apostle Paul. And finally, that grand lesson. We have the sentence of death in ourselves. Now, most of us would have cast in, but he didn't. He knew that he couldn't die except at the command of God. No. Why, this test has come my way. God will not suffer you to be tested above that you are able. God apportions that test. Isn't that wonderful? All things, all things work together for good. Isn't it wonderful? Doesn't it make your life tremendously interesting, praise God? So we glory in tribulations also. Hallelujah. Oh, it's interesting. It's wonderful. Here's a tribulation. Here's another storm. And one day, when there were 4,000 men beside women and children, and Jesus fed them, next day there were 5,000 beside women and children. And this time, they brought all the kids because naturally, they thought, here we get free lunch. <laughs> and the disciples, and Jesus said, how many did I feed yesterday? And now, because you don't have any loaves with you, what's the matter? Where's your faith? I'm still here. Beloved Jesus is always at the right hand of the Father. And he'll be there till he comes for you, and he won't come until the overcomers are really complete. And are we learning our lesson? Oh, that's the question. It's an individual matter. It's a personal matter. And the promises of God are only to the overcomers. Have you ever noticed that in Revelation? They that overcome. 
And not only that, he says, he that overcomes, it's an individual matter. The epistle is to the church, but the promise is to the individual. Praise God. He that overcomes, oh Jesus, to know thee is to know the power of your resurrection. Hallelujah. Oh, Dirima and they that know thy name. That's the blessing of knowing Jesus. He that sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. We'll fall from one pit into the other because we don't know our Savior. Beloved, our lives today ought to be a testimony to the wonder of Jesus. Not our lips, but our lives. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And our lives ought to be lives of trust. Not only trusting God to pay your bills, that's a small matter. But trusting God for your spiritual victory. Trusting God for your children if they're unsafe, your husband, your wife. Oh, what wonders have we experienced along that line. Putting our trust in Him makes Him responsible to manifest the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe. Today, the, the program is acceleration. I remember when one of our sisters bought a new Ford, a Model T Ford. My, we looked at that thing. It looked brilliant like an empty car, and we thought, my. And then when she allowed me to run that thing, now it looks funny, you know, it looked like a goat, a, a sort of a, an overbalanced thing. But to run that thing, it, it felt as if you were going a hundred miles an hour. There must have been 12 horsepower in this novel. And one time I got into a traffic jam and I stepped on the gas and the thing wouldn't move. It just crawled along. But today, we have 130 horses in this novel. Buick, just think. Catch 130 horses, right? 200. 230 Californians. <laughs> <laughs> and you know when you get on the open road, you can't help it. That power is there waiting to snort along the road. Breathe along just that tip of your finger. It's just waiting to, to make that thing run like six. And here is the power waiting, waiting for a vet, waiting for someone that puts that trust in God. And what is that power for? Why to defeat the powers of Satan and of darkness upon this earth? But it doesn't come like so many people think. Oh, heaven is all you have to do. That's defeat. We're in a school. Paul is in a school. You and I are in a school of the Holy Ghost. He shall guide you into all truth. And he doesn't put the thing up here where you lose it again. But he'll put it into your bones, into your life, into your blood. He makes you a son of God. We're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And that's how it comes. We're displayed as we put our trust in him. Step by step to the glory land. Step by step, he leads us with a guiding hand. Step by step. And now he says, and God delivered us from so great a death, and we trust he shall yet deliver us. Now Paul has learned his lesson. Now he has shifted the gear. He has no longer looked at himself, no longer studied about violins and stuff, and had a thermometer with him in his pocket. But he trusted in God who raised us to death. Beloved, our God has already raised us from the dead. Praise God. He says, you're not a debtor to the flesh. You don't have to count calories. There's another fountain inside of you. It's he that raised Jesus from the dead. I, I don't think I could work if I couldn't trust in that fountain and that fountain didn't flow within me. It's something very wonderful. It's something beyond divine healing. It's divine life. It's life from heaven. 
It's the life of Jesus Christ. But it will not become my portion until I have gone through with God. In nothing be anxious, but in everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. That's unloading, rolling it on Him. It's a job. It's been my job ever since I got into the ministry. People look at me and sometimes they say, well, he's been pretty successful. No, he hasn't. It's been Jesus Christ. I've had lots of problems to face, and my job has been to unroll them on Jesus. It takes a lot of prayer. I'd be ashamed to tell you how much I've got to pray, even today. I'm not rid of it yet. But oh, how wonderful to unroll everything on him. But if I don't do it, it'll crush me. And I can have all the holy phrases in my mouth. I can read all the books about faith and trust that I want. And I can swing around with advertising my own faith and so on. That's no good. It needs to be gold tried in the fire. There are people that, oh my, they came to the faith home in Zion and, and they couldn't understand why we didn't have lumps of butter on the table every morning. Why, we thought, you folks live by faith, you ain't got no faith. But listen, after they'd been there a week, they didn't have faith for a two cent postage stamp. They had to go and steal it someplace or borrow it. That's where you find out whether your trust is real or not. In the hour of trial. Praise God. And God in his great mercy sometimes allows real tests to come our way. Did you ever feel as if your test was greater than anybody else's? Well, that shows that it's unique. That's the way God does. Praise the Lord. He fits the shoe. It fits, doesn't it? Praise God. Well, now you can kick and fuss. It'll never help you any. You remember the legend by Shamito of a, a man that was going to the holy city and his, he found his cross much too heavy. Oh, he said, my cross is heavier than anybody else. My, I can't make the grave. It isn't right. God's given me too heavy a cross. And so he had a vision and he came to a house, beautiful palace. And the angel said, now here is the Arsenal, here you can pick a cross that you like, if you don't like your cross. So he put it down at the entrance, and he went through the whole museum, and he found silver crosses and gold crosses and crosses studded with diamonds, little ones and big ones, and he tried them all, and finally found one that he thought was measured to him. He said, I think I'll take this. Of all the crosses in the whole palace, only this one suited him. And when he looked at it, it was the one he had laid down when he came in. (laughs) And now it had gotten dark, and he thought, I'd better rush, because they'll close the gates of the holy city. And so when he came within sight of the city, he saw the porter already closing the gate, and he thought he had to run. But as he ran, he came to a river, and there was no bridge across the river. Now he's going to make it. He yelled! And the porter said, try your cross. And so he put that cross there and look, it fit exactly. It was a bridge. He could walk over on it. Now if it had cut off a bit, it would have been too short. Oh, beloved, our God is wonderful. To learn that one lesson, to trust, trust the Lord, it makes you love him. It, it makes you really love your God. But you can choose. You can be a, a crab all your life. You know, the older we get, the more crabbed we become. Did you ever find that out, especially if you're a great saint? You become so cantankerous that nobody can stand you anymore. You'll be kicking about everybody else. But if you learn your lesson, life will flow from you. Rivers of life. Jesus Christ will make a vessel out of you. Hallelujah. And it was the Son of God who put his trust in the Father when they all was true. God raised him from the dead and gave him a name which is above every name, thank God. And he is waiting today for you and for me to not trust in ourselves anymore, but in him who is risen from the dead. He is our Savior. 
But he cannot be mine if I don't trust him. If I don't learn to live by the faith of the Son of God and praise the Lord, really and truly put my trust after a while it becomes your habit. After a while it becomes so pleasant that when a problem comes you say, well, you smile instead of kiss. You just smile and say, well, Lord, I wonder what you're going to do now. I told how I was locked in there in South America when everybody was gone and inadvertently I let the door go close and here I was under the tropical sun. And I didn't know when the folks would come home. And I just smiled and said, well, Jesus, this is wonderful. Here I'll be baking like an apple till those folks come home. But you know, I reached into my pocket and inadvertently I have taken a key with me from Brooklyn. I didn't know I had it there. And when I tried that key, it opened that lock. Now the strange thing was this. When I came home, I had that key copied by a locksmith and he looked at it. He said, this is a very rare key. It'll open only one in 15,000 locks. And I'm sorry I didn't try that twice, you know. But it opened that one lock in South America. Now the Lord knew that. Wonderful. It's really wonderful. It becomes a habit by and by. And you realize that every test that comes your way is not your test, but his. Elijah, when he came to Jordan, he said, Where is the God of Elijah? Now, let's see. And he took Elijah's mantle and smote the waters in this part. Where is the Father of my Lord Jesus Christ now? Glory to God. But beloved, it's got to be real. And Philippians 4, 6 is a lesson that very few people are willing to learn. It's too hard a job. 